Good morning, good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, if this is your first time at Denver Community Church, great, me too. I've never been here before, but I am friends with a lot of people in this community, and this is my first time here. Uh, I'm a visiting uh, friend, artist, and I'm doing a thing tonight, but I, uh, I'm here with my friend Jason Miller speaking today, and I'm glad to be with you all. Uh, Traditionally at churches or in sacred gatherings, we have like a call to worship, a call to respond. Um, uh, vocationally, I'm a visual artist. And so I was like, hey, could I ask, invite the community to do some image contemplation as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls for our time together? So we're going to walk through a few images together if that's cool with you. The first one is... Uh, this is called kintsugi, and it's an ancient Japanese practice of breaking pottery. And then, guys, I want to let you know that I'm not going to do this image. Look, if you're a professional speaker and you're still doing, have you not heard of kintsugi? Speakers have been using this uh, metaphor for like 15 years, and it's over. Next slide. It's over. We're not going to use this metaphor anymore. If you're a professional speaker and you're using this, look at some art books. There's other things to look at. It's like if you're a preacher and you're still using matrix uh, parables, all right? That's it. That's a joke just for me. Okay, let's do this. Look at this. If, you, if somebody asked you and they said, draw a candle and draw a candle flame, how would you go about doing that? How do you draw a candle flame? Well, if you were going to use like a white piece of paper and some graphite, you may outline the flame. But how you actually draw light is you have to draw all the things that are around the light. You draw the negative space around it. You reveal light. You can't draw light. You have to reveal the light. And in art, in, in art practice, we call this the negative space, right? The negative space. It's the space around the thing that helps reveal the image itself. You can go to the next slide. And this is used a lot in art. If you look at different things, uh, paintings, illustrations, and stuff, often you'll have the main subject matter, but sometimes artists have taken, they've focused on the space around it to reveal the thing. Like you could take this stool, you could say, I'm going to draw this stool, but you could also do a drawing of the school by drawing the spaces that are around the stool, right? This morning, uh, Jason, and we're going to spend time on a passage in Matthew that it has to deal with a bit of a paradox. And I'm not going to expound on that passage because Jason is going to do that more eloquently. You can go to the next slide. But it, one of the things that we find in dealing with paradox is that we're finding like ourselves in like two things and we don't know how to deal with it. And so we find ourselves in the mystery of it. And I wonder if we could uh, use the idea of negative space as like, how do we understand what it feels like to be in the middle space of it? Because often in our spiritual journey, there's a lot of things we can't focus on, but we can focus on the things that are around it that help illuminate the thing in the middle. Like in my own experience, it's taken surprisingly a good amount of sorrow to find joy. It's taken a good amount of darkness to see the light. And it's taken a good amount of, like, unbelief to find belief. I, I actually feel, uh, like, of late, I don't really know how to describe God to people. If people want to talk about God, I'm like, uh, I don't really know how to do that right now. Um, and I actually found that it's in the places of maybe, like, unbelief or, or, or not knowing how to describe God that gives me a picture of God. Because when I talk about God, look, I'm, it's not an old man in the sky. That's not what I'm talking about anymore, Right? Um, one of the things that's really helped me is like gratitude. Gratitude has really helped me understand God a bit more. I, I think there's this really interesting thing in people that we all have this innate sense to say thank you at some point in our life. Like if Brad Pitt walked in this room, I'd be like, great. Hi, Brad. Thanks for coming. But if Ira Glass, the host of This American Life, walked in this room, I would put this microphone down, probably take off my coat and come and be like, thank you for all the work that you've done. Right? Because this <laughs> Ira Glass, this artist, had like created all the stuff that's really impacted my life. And because of the transformation I've received of that, I innately, there's this thing in me that just longs to say thank you. This has happened. I'm sure you've had the same experience. Somebody who's gifted you or, or you know, like transform your life, you, you, this desire to say thank you. To me, that leads to, lends or points to some kind of divine and sacred activity. Um, also, like 
consciousness. <laughs> you know, I, I've been going through some uh, difficult things in my family. My, my son has gone through some hard surgeries of late, and there's been a lot of loss in our friend group and stuff like that. And I think that there's a certain aspect of life that feels hard and dark and, and meaninglessness, you know, but then I was talking with a priest friend of mine, and I was like, but we're all here, and it's kind of still a miracle that we're all here, and I'm kind of a miracle, and you're all a miracle, and you're all a miracle. Like, what is this thing? Who are we? This, this consciousness, that's, that's, it's worth spending some time thinking about. It helps me, this negative space helps me see that maybe there's, it points to the divine. I want to end on this last image. This is a painting called The Holy Night by Antonio da Carigio. I'm sure I said that wrong. Uh, he was an Italian artist, and uh, this was actually his first big church commission. And uh, it's, he did this interesting thing. You know, one of the things that's interesting in the Christian tradition is that uh, in the incarnation story of Jesus, uh, he was not born in some palace. He was not born to royalty, as a lot of other faith traditions have uh, stories about them. But he was born in, in the simplicity of human ordinariness. And in this painting, Antonio, or Tony, uh, as his friends call him, uh, he set the light source on the incarnation, right? And then that incarnation was shining light on all of these other aspects of a human life. And I think in his faith, in what he's expressing, he's like, what I've found to be true is that this presence of God in my life helps illuminate all the other things, all the other aspects of my life. And, and I think this morning, we're probably all here. If we took time to say, hey, how's your life going? What's going on? We would describe probably some wonderful things and some hard things, some mysterious things, some exhausting things. And it would... And there may be some aspects of you're like, oh, I feel like I, uh, I can accomplish faith. And maybe there's other aspects of your life you're like, I don't know how to do this faith thing at all. And I wonder if those aspects of our life, maybe we could call those those negative spaces, that they would actually help us see that, that, that Christ is still in the midst of that, right? Uh, like those of you here, some of you are like tired parents or caregivers. And that space lets us know that, hey, love is a bit of a verb, which is a vintage DC talk uh, reference there. Uh, <laughs> some of you feel like lost kind of in your life, maybe vocationally. And isn't it interesting that Jesus gave us so many stories about being lost, right? Like a coin and a son and a, and a, a sheep, right? Some of you maybe feel like, uh, I don't really understand I, I'm actually like a, a little bit depressed. I'm secretly depressed and having a hard time. And you know what? In our sacred text, there's a book in the middle of it where the author expounds. He's like, life is kind of meaninglessness, uh, but it also has a lot of meaning too. And it's in these, uh, this light and this dark, this negative space, this positive space that we find that we're transformed in the middle of that. So as we're going to go into song and sacrament and teaching this morning, just wanted you to think about maybe the images or the places that you find or you're in the, the negative space or the unknown space and, and how that could go together. Glad you're here this morning. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. Um, I'm supposed to introduce someone who's not here. That's not a joke. Uh, I'll start and maybe he'll show up. Uh, anyway, good morning. Good to see all of you. As Scott said, uh, our friend Jason Miller is here. Uh, I first met Jason actually on a long telephone call about uh, five years ago, and I was instantly struck by how thoughtful he is, how intentional he is. Uh, and since that time, I've been able to experience his heart as someone who's able to hold difficult things with a ton of grace and a ton of humility, and he truly has a pastor's heart. He's with us today, somewhere in this building, we assume. Um, I don't know if this is like part of his gig or whatever. Hannah, do we know where he is? He's where? Oh, there you are. Hey, I was just introducing you. I was introducing you. No, there was, a, there was just one song. Okay. <laughs> this is going so well. Uh, so Jason also wrote a book called When the World Breaks, and as I said, he's thoughtful, he's compassionate, he's able to hold hard things, and this book is really a reflection of that, and he's coming to share from his heart uh, about what he's learned not only 
through his study and his hard work, but also through the life he's lived. So would you finally welcome to the platform with me, Mr. Jason Miller. Uh, it's a privilege to be with you all. Um, I know Michael genuinely would not want this to be about him. You know it's his birthday, right? Yeah. And my first connection to Denver Community Church happened a few years ago when uh, we realized that your community had let out in a way that we wanted to follow as far as including our LGBTQ brothers and sisters in our community. And so a mutual friend uh, introduced me to Michael and he became a wise guide for us in that season and continues to be. Uh, and so through him and through a lot of your team, I've gotten to know your community. Our team was out here in October. Uh, we love you all. And it's really a privilege to be here. Um, before I get into this, this is a little awkward, but Becky on slides, can you get rid of the Kintsugi slide? <laughs> At the center of my talk, the broken pottery, just get rid of that. We're going to move on. Great. I kid. Um, anybody been to Lower Manhattan and seen this particular memorial? Let me put it on the slides here. Yeah, it's from 9-11. Yeah, you might know this. Uh, this is a memorial that's built on the exact footprint, there's two of them, uh, where those two buildings fell back in 2001. And if you've been there and stood at the edges of this thing, you know it's kind of massive and kind of haunting. Uh, one of the designers of it says that this uh, architecture is called the void. And they said they did that to render absence visible. And I, I put that in front of you uh, because it strikes me that we could have done other things there. Now, maybe to you it seems inevitable that as a people, we would have built a memorial to what was lost on 9-11. But if you think about our actual reactions to loss and grief, it strikes me that if you took those reactions and projected them into this experience, we might have done something different. Like there might have been an impulse to simply pave over that place, to just sort of act like nothing had ever happened there, right? So that you could walk there and be unaware of the massive loss that occurred for all of us on that day. I mean, that's a lot of times what we do with loss, isn't it? Just kind of pave over it, try to cover it up, pretend it's not there. Or, or maybe right there on that exact footprint rather than next to it where we did do this, maybe right there on that exact footprint we might have just built something bigger and shinier as if to say, like, you can't defeat us, right? Although I suspect we would have built that not just to give a message to our enemies about our strength, but to say something to ourselves about our strength because grief unnerves us and it leaves all kinds of sort of rattling existential questions in us about why we are so vulnerable. You know, you can just be like trucking along, having built a life that you love, and then something happens completely out of your control with no regard for whether you wanted it, and all of a sudden something or someone you loved is gone, and you have to figure out what you're gonna do with that void, right? I raise this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I think the last few years have brought extraordinary loss. I mean, I know every season of life as human beings brings loss, and the loss could be the loss of a dream, or the loss of a relationship, or the loss of like a really nice arrangement, or the loss of security or safety, or something that makes you feel really good in your life, or it could be the loss of an actual loved one. And I just think it's obvious and plain that the last few years, because they've brought extraordinary change through pandemic life and changing economics and politics and everything else, change means loss, and so we're facing a lot of it, and we have to figure out what we're gonna do with it. And I also raise this because, uh, like Scott mentioned earlier, I've been wrestling for quite a while now, with these very strange things that Jesus says in the beginning of the book of Matthew. Uh, we sometimes call them the Beatitudes, these uh, bizarre blessings that he gives. And today I just wanna drop down into one of those blessings and see if it can speak to us or work on us and share a little bit with you about how it's been working on me. Uh, so this is where we're going today. It's Matthew chapter five, verse four. If you've got Bibles, you can find it there. And it's just one simple little line at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is uh, as he's about to launch into three chapters of sort of soaring teaching on what it is to be human in the kingdom of God, to be alive with God, and to live the kind of life God would live in flesh. But before he gets into all of that, he gives these strange blessings. And in Matthew 5, verse 4, with the second blessing, he says simply this, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I want to work that out with you. I want to like wonder with you a little bit about where he gets that from and how it might work on us. So for a minute, let's talk about where he might get that from. For Jesus, a first century Jewish teacher to stand up and talk about mourning or loss, uh, it strikes me and it strikes a lot of people that he's probably borrowing from this deep well of wisdom that his people had uh, sort of worked out in a prayer book called the Psalms. 
And I know some of you are like super familiar with the Psalms, known for greatest hits like the Lord is my shepherd, uh, like things that get embroidered on pillows, right? Uh, Lots of strange prayers in the Psalms there too. But this is the prayer book of the Jewish people. It would have been his prayer book. He would have known it cover to cover. He would have been formed by it. He, He would have learned to pray from these prayers. And there's some interesting things that you'll learn if you observe these prayers. So first of all, uh, there's this scholar named Gunkel 100 years ago, and Gunkel's looking at the Psalms, and he says there's basically three kinds of Psalms. There's three big movements that happen, and out of 150 Psalms, all of them seem to fit into one of these three categories. So the first category he mentions is praise. These are the ones that are pretty straightforward. They're like, God, you're great. Now, I don't know if you like feel that welling up in you, uh, and I don't know if you would be prone to say something like, God, you're great. But if you've ever had a day when everything just kind of fit together, like your life is good and you're aware of it, you know where you're going and you can feel it, that's the kind of sentiment expressed here. It's just the feeling that like up is up and down is down and you can find your place in these things and life is good. And for the psalmist, for the person who's kind of prone toward prayer, that turns into just God, you're great, just straightforward, right? Those are psalms of praise. Then you've got psalms of thanksgiving, which are very similar. They say, God, you're great, but they say, God, you're great because you've done something to put my feet back on solid ground after the earth was quaking for a little bit. And so, like, God, you're great, but specifically because you've done something to deliver me, to heal me, to lead me into a better future. So praise, thanksgiving, they sound similar. But then there's psalms of lament. And these are the psalms that bleed. I mean, they ache. They cry out. Like they beg God to deliver. They, they name a world that's breaking and a life that's breaking and haunting questions about why on earth God would allow all this stuff, right? Now, here's one interesting thing as you look at these psalms of different genres. If you like add up all the psalms that qualify as psalms of praise and you kind of tally that up, and then you add up all the psalms that qualify as psalms of thanksgiving and you kind of tally that up, and then you look at all the psalms that qualify as lament and you tally that up, guess which category is by far the biggest? Lament. Yeah, you guys have been well taught, apparently. Good job, Michael. Um, Yeah, lament is the overriding category of prayer. The overriding expression in these psalm prayers is lament. Let me give you a sampling. Maybe you've heard these kinds of prayers from psalms. Maybe you haven't. Let me give you a sampling of these. So this is Psalm 44. The psalmist says, you've crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered over us with deep darkness. Or how about this in Psalm 60? We are given no signs from God. Oh, sorry. You've shaken the land and torn it open. Mend its fractures for its quaking. You've shown your people desperate times. Or this one from Psalm 74. We are given no signs from God. No prophets are left. And none of us knows how long this will be. This is sort of the emo branch of uh, psalm prayers. (laughs) So that's the kind of stuff that most frequently traffics in the psalms. And it's funny, by the way, like, I I don't know if you pray at dinner with your family or if you're part of a group that prays together or if you're part of a church thing where you pray together. Like, you know the popcorn thing where you, like, pray whatever's on your mind? Like, yeah, I I just try to picture, like, somebody showing up at prayer at dinner or, like, popcorn prayer with your small group and it's your turn to pray and you're just like, Lord, you have made us a haunt for jackals. (laughs) And I suspect that people are worried about you, right? Because this kind of like raw, naked lament is not the ordinary modality of our connection with each other. And it's not the way that we imagine meeting God together. But in the Psalms, it's often the way that they imagine meeting God together by naming these really hard losses that they faced. So that's an important observation. And I wonder if that informs the way that Jesus speaks when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. But there's something else that goes on in these Psalms. There's a feature, if, if you looked at all the Psalms of lament, you'll notice that they all kind of have the same two-part movement. They they do two basic things. So out of the gate, they they lament, they cry out. They they name the thing that has happened either poetically or directly. They get really uh, raw about it. And then they turn to praise. There's a psalm that begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which you might know is the prayer that Jesus prays on the cross. In the beginning, it bleeds, it cries out. But just a few verses later, the same psalm says, I will declare your name in the great assembly. Uh, From you comes the theme of my praise. And that's pretty normal for these prayers of lament. They begin in lament and they end in praise. And when I first noticed this, I was just doing like typical grad school theology work where you study these kinds of things. And I saw that and scholars pointed it out. I got really freaking annoyed. Because it reminded me of the kind of like, sentimental BS greeting card faux spirituality that I grew up in. 
You know that kind of space that like gives momentary lip service to how you've been shattered and then quickly moves on from it and says, put a smile on your face, act like everything's better. And it sounds pious, but it's actually just this really unhealthy form of spiritual bypassing where you use your faith to deny the reality that you're living in rather than to face it. I can't stand that stuff and I've seen the harm that it causes. I mean, I know that there are times when somebody can authentically move quickly from lament to praise, and that can be a beautiful and powerful movement in your life. But more often, what I've seen is so many of us who we were just told or taught that that's what you're supposed to do, and so we try to make that quick turn while we leave our own heart behind. I don't think it works. But then uh, there's this other thing about spiritual texts that you might not know and I've been learning, which is spiritual texts tend to express in microcosm something that takes much longer in real life. So just because you can like open up Psalm 22 and read on the page and within two or three minutes go from lament to praise, that may not mean that you are meant to be able to go from lament to praise. So if it's not like prescribing this quick movement from loss to glory, you could instead just get curious about it and begin to ask, is there something about acts of lament? Is there something about loss and naming loss? Is there something about that movement that puts us in a position where later we will find that we have an expanded capacity for wonder or praise? That's a question I've been wrestling with for quite a while and something I've been learning about, uh, in particular uh, through the experience of a dear friend of mine. So let me tell you uh, about a friend of mine named Alex. Uh, Alex and I became uh, friends in college. Uh, I quickly got to know him as this guy who was just effortlessly cool and unfailingly kind. Uh, We connected like at both ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, he's the life of the party, just really fun to be around when we're having a good time. But on the other hand, he's exactly the kind of person that you'd want to be with when you're working out something really personal or philosophical. Uh, After college, I bought this shabby old house in South Bend and myself and Alex and like six other friends moved into this three bedroom house because we were trying to like make up for the fact that we didn't get to have fraternities at the Christian college that we attended for undergrad. So we all move in together. Uh, We'd sit on the roof of the house with like really crappy convenience store cigars. And we just kind of like talk about things that we were wondering about. I smoke better cigars today, don't worry. Um, We'd uh, go downtown to South Bend to Fiddler's Hearth, this uh, old Irish pub there. And we'd order pints of Guinness trying to make up for the the lack of beer consumption during college. And we would just kind of talk about all the things that we were wondering about and wrestling with. And like through all of that, I just, like many who knew him, developed a real affection for this person and who he was. Uh, While we were living together, I could sense he had these like big energies inside that wanted to be channeled into something meaningful. Uh, At the time, he was working construction, which is great, but it wasn't the fit for him. And so then one day, I wasn't entirely surprised when I got home and he'd been waiting for me and he said, hey, I wanna show you something. So we go up to his room and on his computer desktop screen, he shows me the website for this fledgling nonprofit whose mission was to raise awareness and activism on behalf of child soldiers being exploited in Joseph Coney's Coney's war in uh, Central Africa. And you could just see the energy in him. He lit up and I had a feeling he would be leaving soon and he did. So he moves out to San Diego where he takes up the cause. Well, eventually after interning there, um, Alex landed in a position where his job was to reach out to artists and these artists would use their platforms to help others learn about what they were doing. And so I would be getting dispatches from Alex. He would be like on tour buses and in backstage green rooms with all my favorite rock stars. And like, it's, it's like everybody fell in love with that same effortless, cool and unfailing kindness. I remember one day while he was out there on the road, I got a package in the mail, wasn't expecting anything and I open it, it's a book. It's a book by a philosopher named Aristotle. The name of the book is Nicomachean Ethics, which doesn't really matter. But in the book, the philosopher talks about friendship and he says there's basically three kinds of friendship. He says there's kind of lower forms of friendship where you're really kind of using each other. But then he says there's this beautiful and virtuous kind of friendship where you're drawn to the good in them and they're drawn to the good in you and they want to draw the good out of you and you want to draw the good out of them. You're rooting for the best part of them and they're rooting for the best part of you. And he, with no note, had simply uh, drawn a bracket around that paragraph and put an asterisk next to it, which is like a typically cool way for Alex to do something really kind. Uh, a couple years later, uh, he fell in love with uh, the woman he would marry, uh, Beth. And Beth was living in Nashville, Tennessee, so Alex moved to Nashville to be with her. And then he started kind of cryptically asking me about different dates and whether I would be in Nashville, which is my way of realizing he was asking me if I would officiate their wedding. And so after we worked out the calendar, I found myself there in Tennessee on this beautiful afternoon under this massive old tree. And I had the the joy and the privilege of watching Beth and Alex make their vows to each other. 
A couple months later, I got a text from Alex. It says, hola, amigo. Thought you'd want to see the newest mini member of our family. And then he sent me a picture of the ultrasound. And I, I could just feel that after all these years of sort of running around and chasing big dreams, he was finding a different kind of joy in having a family and digging roots. And all of that joy and rootedness made the next thing really, really confusing for me. Got a text uh, from another friend, Matt. And Matt said, hey, man, uh, you have a minute? I call him. Uh, and he asked if I'm alone. Uh, I say, yeah. And then he tells me Alex had died by suicide. And it just like bounced off my head, you know. Uh, I didn't like have a capacity to even recognize what he was saying. So for a couple of days, I'm totally numb. And then after a couple of days, uh, I had to travel to New York for work. And so I'm walking the streets of lower Manhattan, where at one point I bump into that memorial that I showed you at 9-11. And after that numbness sort of begins to wear away while we're walking around, this like, this like tidal wave, this like nauseous grief just like starts rising up inside me and consuming me. So I awkwardly excuse myself and I go back to the hotel room. I just, I mean, as you can imagine, I just um, completely fall apart. I remember uh, my brother calling me in the hotel room and asking how I was doing. And all I could say was, um, I didn't know it was possible to hurt this bad. Uh, a week or two later, uh, the funeral for Alex was in Nashville, and his wife had asked me to deliver a eulogy for Alex. And so I drive down knowing that this is going to be a kind of impossible congregation. I, I knew that people were kind of traveling in from all over the world uh, to say goodbye to Alex. And the night before the funeral, I'm sitting on the couch of a friend's house. I'll be sleeping on the couch that night, and I have this yellow legal pad in front of me where I'm supposed to figure out what to say at Alex's funeral. And um, I've been preaching for like 20 years, and when you preach that long, you have all these instincts. You develop muscle memory around what to do. But the bizarre thing is like a lot of those instincts have to do with explaining things. Let me kind of help you chart a coherent path through this mystery that you were walking in. And as those instincts tried to kick in, I could just feel how wildly inappropriate that would be. To presume to get up in front of that unlikely congregation and try to explain this moment. Um, so that, that really rattled me because I'm like, well, I got to do something tomorrow. And, I, and none of my instincts are helping right now, you know. And I remember praying with a, a kind of desperation that night that um, I haven't often prayed with. Because I wanted to do right by Alex and I wanted to do right by his wife and I thought about his parents and I thought about his brothers and I thought about how alone he must have felt uh, even though he wasn't alone at all but after a while just like sobbing and feeling completely lost a different kind of clarity emerged and it reminded me of that void in New York City where there's no explaining there's, there's no wrapping this up you simply build a void and give witness to what was lost. Just that. And as that different kind of clarity began to develop in me, I, I felt a, a conviction that that was my only job the next day. And so the next day at that funeral, I remember um, entering the back door of the central aisle of this old historic church on the campus of Vanderbilt uh, in a room packed full of people. And I had Beth on my arm. Uh, she was very pregnant at that time, so I was kind of helping her walk down the aisle. And I was also walking Coloco, their German shepherd, whom Alex had loved as much as he had loved anything. And Coloco was there to sort of keep vigil for Beth at that horrible event. And we sat in the front row, and, and then a moment came for me to get up and turn and face this room. Now, every pastor I know has done hard funerals. It's kind of part of the job. I've never seen like a sea of anguish quite like that, you know? Um, but I got up there and I thought, I'm just going to give witness. And so I told them about meeting Alex in college and that effortless, cool, and unfailing kindness. And I told them about um, him finding his passions channeled into that dream out in San Diego. I told them about how before he moved, I, I had this golden retriever when we were all living together, this 90-pound pile of love and hair, you know. And I, I told them about how... Um, it didn't matter how many people were in the room. It didn't matter who else was there, even me. 
if Jack, my dog, walked into a room where Alex was present, or if Alex walked into a room where Jack, the dog, was present, Jack would always and only seek out Alex for a particularly inappropriate canine display of dominance and affection. <laughs> yes, I'm saying Jack would hump Alex, only, always Alex. It's like even Jack had a crush on him, you know? Um, I told them about seeing his dreams light up in that mission. I told them about him falling in love with Beth. I told them about how he had already become a loving father of that child that she was carrying. Uh, I told them that if you watched Alex from a distance, you might think he was a little bit frenetic, kind of moving here and there, but that if you knew him, you know that he had a, a compass in his chest with two cardinal directions, one pointing toward beauty and the other toward justice. And I think he was just trying to work out how to follow that compass. And together we told Alex that we loved him and that we missed him like hell. Uh, a couple weeks later, uh, the funeral would continue in San Diego, and I wasn't going to go. Uh, the San Diego thing was because a lot of the people that he had worked with still lived out there, and they wanted to do some more things to honor him, which sounded beautiful, but there was a couple of problems with it for me. One, I didn't really know most of those people, so I wasn't sure how I would show up in that. Uh, two, the week between the Nashville funeral and the San Diego funeral, my family was on the waters of Lake Erie scattering the ashes of my grandfather. And between Alex's funeral and saying goodbye to my grandfather, I just didn't know if I had anything left in me. But here's the other thing, and this is real. Going to San Diego, it just felt inefficient. Do you know what I mean? There comes a point in like acts of grieving where we live in this sort of industrialized, efficiency-driven world where we've been told in so many different ways that you shouldn't do inefficient things. You shouldn't waste time or energy on things that don't have some direct causal connection to the results that you want. That's just the world that we live in today. And I think somewhere inside me, I looked at like the money to fly to San Diego and the time to fly to San Diego, and it just felt inefficient. So I wasn't going to do it. But then one of the people organizing the events in San Diego reached out and asked if I was coming and if I would say a few words about Alex, and that turned me enough to make the trip. So I got to San Diego, and one of the things that we did to say goodbye to Alex comes from surf culture, where Alex had become an avid searcher, surfer while he was there, and it's called a paddle out. It's this really beautiful thing where all kinds of people who may have never surfed before, we grab surfboards, and we, they're on the shores of La Jolla on a really dark day whose skies seemed to kind of match the mood that we were in. We all kind of paddled out far out under the water there on the ocean. And then we kind of clustered up. We kind of held each other on the boards in this little improvised flotilla. And we told stories about Alex and we sang songs and we cried a lot. And then we kind of fanned out into this ring. And Beth, who was very pregnant at this point, somehow made it out there on a kayak. And she was wearing a lei in honor of Alex. And so she took the lei and she threw it out into the middle of the water. And we dug our hands into the ocean and we splashed toward it in an act of love and honor. And even as I'm just sobbing, I remember having this feeling. It's like, um, you know when you see th something in the peripheral vision and if you try to turn your eyes toward it, you lose it? It's like it, it only exists there at the peripheral edge of what you can see. And the feeling at the periphery for me was that something healing is happening here. I just don't know what it is, you know? And then that night, uh, this is the part of the story that's hard for me to tell. Because I'm afraid it's going to sound uh, insignificant or like too woo-woo. Um, and I'm not prone to woo, by the way. It's not my, my type. Um, but I just have to trust you with it. Because this is important in the story. And I just have to trust that you're going to like go with me into this moment. And it's simply this. That night uh, on the shores there in La Jolla, I looked up and the sky was set on fire. Uh, I can still kind of like see it right now. And um, this was like more than a sunset. It's all I can tell you. There was something more going on. This was more than like light banking off clouds and being colored by the atmosphere. It was like electricity in the air. It was like, it felt like a little like secret had been cracked open in the universe and revealed itself for just a moment. And I found myself weeping and shouting because it was almost as if like the electricity going through me from that event in the sky, it was gonna like, it was gonna like explode me if I didn't express it somehow. And something about that moment created this whole turn toward healing for me 
that began to convince me, not just in my brain, but in my bones, um, that in some strange way, nothing had actually been lost. Now, let me try to work this out with you a little bit theologically. And I don't know if this will work for you. Um, this is just me reasoning with you about what I see in the text. And you can push back or you can walk away and say, dude from South Bend is weird. That's fine with me. You can take this however you want. But this is the way I've begun to work this out. And it, it starts with an observation that the writers of Scripture had a fundamentally different relationship with the things that they saw and tasted and touched and smelled and heard than you and I do. Because for a couple hundred years, you and I have been living in this whole, in this whole world of, of thinking and experience that says there's nothing more here than what meets the eye. It's a sort of one-dimensional reading of the reality around us, but these ancient writers had a three-dimensional reading. They, they saw a depth in things, a, a capacity within things that transcended the material. Uh, you see little hints of it in the Psalms. Like in Psalm 19.1, you read this, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I don't think they mean heaven like some like crappy Thomas Kincaid painting of like <laughs> bad light. I mean, I think they actually mean like the sky, like when you look up, Something of the glory of the divine mystery is, is, is on display in things as seemingly material and simple as water vapor and the color blue that's created when the rays of the sun hit our atmosphere, right? The glory of the divine is there. Or how about this, talking about humanity in Psalm 8. You've made humanity a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned humanity with glory and honor, that there's a, a divine glory radiating in every life around you in this room right now and yours too. A divine glory radiating more than skin cells and blood pumping. A divine glory in the people around you. There's another psalm, a Psalm 42, that says deep calls to deep. And I, I've begun to wonder if what the psalmist means is that there's a depth within you that senses the depth around you. And I've begun to think that when we grieve, when we really lose something good or beautiful, it's that depth within you that mourns the loss of that depth, of that glory, of that divine fragment that you were encountering in that person, in that dream, in that beautiful arrangement, in that good thing that you had. Which means that like you're mourning, that grief that you feel, that thing that makes you nauseous sometimes and makes everything gray sometimes and makes you want to... Uh, weep sometimes and makes you want to lash out sometimes, that that comes from a place inside you that sensed the depth around you, a kind of divine radar inside you, which means that your losses are more than the simple sort of uh, psychological inconvenience of a lost attachment. Even though I think that's also going on, I'm like all for good psychology, I just think there's more going on there. There's that deep place within that senses the loss of the deep around you in that person or that dream or that thing that's no longer here. But then... What I've also come to believe is that uh, if it's good or if it's beautiful, it can't be lost because the good things and the beautiful things are of God. And if it's of God, I don't think it can be destroyed. Perhaps it can only be transformed. And so I, I would just tell you today, like not just in my brain, but like in my bones, uh, through moments like that night on the beach in La Jolla, I've, I've come to believe in my bones that what I'm being taught is that the good and the beautiful that I loved in my friend Alex, it hasn't been destroyed, it hasn't disappeared, it's simply been transformed. And that by grieving, by actually ritualizing that loss, by turning to moments of lament, by enacting the things that help us give witness to, the, to what we have lost, that somehow those processes, somehow those movements, somehow those brave acts reinforce your capacity, your connection to that place within that senses the glory around you. So when you ignore your grief, when you pave over it, when you medicate it, when you just decide that you're not gonna be subject to your grief, the tragedy is that you're cutting yourself off from the very capacity within that could then lead you later to comfort. Because the same thing that you were cutting yourself off from, that same capacity that God has given us, the deep within you that senses the deep around you, if you don't want to live in relationship to the deep within you, you're not going to live in, in relationship to the glory around you. Because it's that deep place that senses those things. So this is why, like, if you've lost something, whether it's a loved one or a dream or um, something that mattered to you, something that was good and beautiful, I would, like, I would encourage you, like, write a letter to it. Build a monument to it. Carve out a void to give witness to it. Not so that you wallow in it, but simply to give witness to the good and the beautiful that was there 
And in doing so, you might find that the deep within you speaks a little more loudly to you again. And the pain might come from that place, but then the praise might come from that place. And this, I think, is why the psalmists know that stories that begin in lament turn into celebrations of glory. Uh, Let me observe quickly for you. This isn't just uh, an insight for personal loss. This is also really important for social and systemic matters that we are facing. I mean, this same wisdom is why it's important for us to hold candlelight vigils in the wake of mass shootings. It's why it's important for us to say the names of those whose lives have been lost in discriminatory and unjust uses of power. Because, you know, those lives, those are sacred vessels. And even while I think the good and the beautiful in them hasn't fully been destroyed, it's important for us to give witness to what was lost. Because when we give witness to what was lost, we might little by little, step by step, become the kind of people who will defend those lives rather than ignore the fact that they're being treated that way. Now, um, if all of this sounds a little weird, I get it. Uh, The bad news for you is like pretty much everything Jesus does is weird. (laughs) I mean, all the Beatitudes, they're bizarre. Uh, When the Beatitudes begin, blessed are, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit or blessed are those who mourn. I know blessing can seem kind of, I don't know how you feel about that word, like hashtag blessed might be kind of strange for you. Um, But I take this from other scholars who've worked on this. When he says blessed are, he is heightening the expectations of his hearers because blessing for them in the Jewish imagination means a divine insurance policy against suffering. Read the Hebrew scriptures, read the Old Testament. When you find the word blessed, it describes people whose personal virtue gets for them, gains for them a divine insurance policy against suffering. In the Greek in which the gospel is written, makarios, the word for blessed in that text, it means something like what Dallas Willard calls the blissful existence of the gods. Like the deities up there in global cosmic first class with lay flat seats and free alcohol, while the rest of us are back in economy basic with no room for your knees, right? Like it describes this blissful existence of the deities. So he says up there on the mountainside in Matthew 5, he says, I got a word that describes what it's going to take for you to experience the divine insurance policy against suffering. I got a word for you if you want the blissful existence of the gods. You know where you're going to find it? When your heart is poured out and emptied by suffering. When you lose something that mattered, when systems or circumstances bridle your power, which is a way of reading meekness, which he blesses, or when there is an ache inside you, a screaming inside you that says things shouldn't be this way, which is him talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness or justice, he says, I call those experiences the access points for the divine mystery in your life. And if that doesn't sound strange to you, you're not paying attention. (laughs) But the good news for me lately is I keep learning that if it's not strange, it's too small for the mystery. And so he's, he's inviting you into the mystery of this thing. So I, I want to lead you into that first. And before I describe this beautiful kingdom life of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where you learn how to love your enemies and heal the world, first I'm going to invite you into the inner experience of your suffering that you have been ignoring, that you've been running from. And when you do that bravely, you're going to find that God was waiting for you there. Um, I don't uh, have the math on Alex exactly, right? I was talking to um, Alex's widow, Beth, not long ago, and we had a long conversation. Where is Alex? What's the math on him right now? I don't have a lot of detail on that yet. Um, But for reasons I've told you and for others I haven't, I believe in my bones that Alex is held and healed in the love of God. And I'm every bit as convinced that when we turn bravely toward our mourning and loss, we will be held and healed by that same love too. Uh, If you want to join me in a prayer for a moment, I'd invite you to do that. Uh, Loving God, there's been an extraordinary amount of loss in the world at large and in our lives these last few years. We've seen it in headlines. I know that we've also felt it in our hearts, a kind of breaking, a kind of mourning that is crying out. And yet we have been taught in so many ways through our lives that mourning is inefficient. We've been taught uh, to medicate rather than to turn toward it. We've been taught to make ourselves stronger rather than admit our vulnerability in the face of it. And yet in the face of all of those lies and misdirections, I pray that we would hear today the blessing Jesus gives. And that when the time is right, when life calls us to it, that we would turn toward mourning as an act of faith. 
and that we would trust that simply giving witness to the good and the beautiful things that we have lost may someday somehow lead us into a new capacity for praise or wonder. Uh, Even now, if there is grief in the room, if there are hearts that are crying out with a kind of painful loss, I pray that somehow in this moment you would whisper a kind of blessedness to the people who feel those things and that you would begin us on the path that would lead us to a fresh encounter with the glory that will heal us. And I pray through Christ. Amen.